this is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two Girls, One Ghost. And we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne. And I am Sabrina. And I know that you're the one who's about to have a baby, but (laughs) I would like to talk about babies for one second because I am- Sure, go for it. Currently babysitting my goddaughter slash niece, Noemi. It's so fun to say goddaughter. (laughs) Instead of just niece. (laughs) Goddaughter, you have power. Godmother. There is no better feeling than a baby crying when you leave the room. Like (laughs) wanting you so badly that they miss you and they start crying. There's no better feeling. Oh, does it happen with your mom? Yeah. She just loves her relatives. Oh, no. I mean, like it only happens with me. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Like I leave her with my mom. It's so funny because You know, I feel like everyone wants, like, to understand the baby, so we put our own narratives into their minds. But I know. She wants me. Also, I think you have said that you are a great babysitter. So she's like, I know my needs are going to be met. I have all the attention that I need when Sabrina's here. And so I will cry for Sabrina. She will give me exactly what I want. I think I'm I'm so good at it because... (laughs) There's so much of like my inner child, especially right now, like I've spent so much time working on like my inner child that it is so fulfilling, not only to me, but just like my child, my inner child to just be childlike. I can't even tell you the amount of dance moves I've done, the amount of like (laughs) terrible singing I've done, the amount of crawling I've done. If you need a baby babysitter, hit me up. Text me. And it's just like you're responding to every single one of Noemi's needs. Yeah. Which is something that, you know, like to heal your inner child, you're also in a way responding to every one of your needs. That's true. Like you're giving yourself what you want, what baby Sabrina wanted. She did, however, pinch my nipple so hard yesterday, like gave me a purple nipple. And it's not that like my nipple was out. Well, is she is she breastfed? She was, but she was also just like lifting herself up on me and I never wear a bra. And she grabbed my left nipple right, (laughs) like dead spot on on the target, bullseye. Oh my God. And pulled herself up by my nipple. (laughs) I've been seeing these funny videos of people talking about like watching their children kind of like really aggressively do things on their little pacifiers right before they're (laughs) supposed to start breastfeeding and being like, oh my fuck. God. What am I in for? That's about to be my nipple. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Noemi. She's so cute. She is so cute. What a little precious angel. Yeah. Are you so glad you flew out to help your mom? Babysit? I'm so glad. I'm so Take glad. Of her. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you lived on the East Coast, it would be that much easier to just go whenever. I'm telling you, it's becoming closer and closer to reality. I'm pushing for it. I'm pushing hard, (laughs) but not so hard. I'm not pushing as hard as I did in years past because you were entertaining the conversation always. Mm -hmm. And so my heart did break a little bit when I really thought I was like making some serious progress. Then you're like, well, I wouldn't, I'm not actually moving. And I was like, oh, so all these conversations, all of these what ifs, it was all a lie. Well, there's a lot of things that have changed in my life in the last two (laughs) years. And there's a lot of realizations that I've come to. And there's also like, I never wanted LA to be forever. Mm -hmm. And I I think I had said that, but I felt as if my career was so LA based that I didn't have the flexibility or the freedom to go anywhere else. And all, you know, I do have a lot of like family and friends out there or friends that have become family, you know, but, um, Now with the podcast and my change in perception and desire of like my writing career, there's nothing really keeping me in LA. Yeah. You're not truly forced to stay in LA. Right. And you know, you're not the only friend who has given me the false hope of leaving LA to come. Like we had a friend who was literally asking me questions about which towns to live in in Vermont. And I really thought she was going to move. Caitlin, Caitlin and Austin were talking about it for like two years. And every time I brought it up to any of you, you guys were like, what? No, she's never going to do that. What the hell is she talking about? But she would message me and That's she would so ask. Interesting. I don't think she's ever said anything like that to me. Actually, she has said that they've thought about it because the idea of like starting a new somewhere 
and yeah. like just like focusing on them has been appealing. But I think also having family nearby is now that they have little baby Conlon. Yeah. Well, I think that was the conversation before Conlon was came yeah. arriving. It was like, do we really want to raise our child in L.A.? And that was making them kind of like consider other places. And then it was like, oh, but family's in L.A. and family's so important to us in raising him. But yeah, no, this is exactly the conversation I've had with so many people where I'm like, oh, yeah, they were considering. And, and everyone's like, what? They've never said that to me, which is exactly what just happened. But it was a convo and my heart was waiting. I was like, oh, maybe they just need another year, another year, another year. Nope. I'm sorry your heart has been broken. I hope one day it is not broken and it is given showers of love and excitement. And I can't promise it will be me that gives it to you. But I do want (laughs) to say that, well, actually, can I ask if we can tell everyone the name of your baby because you've decided to name your baby after me? (laughs) Oh, I was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Sabrina has decided that my child's name will be Sabrina. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. In what setting were we even talking about this? I can't remember. It was when we were on the phone with John. Oh, 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 yeah. And I was like, wow, I can't believe I didn't think of this until now. But <laughs> Sabrina sounds like a great name. There's no boys, males with little the name boy. Sabrina. It's so perfect. It's original. Also, I have no idea what the fuck is on my sleeve right now. It like looks like remnants of a glazed donut. Did you have a glazed donut? In recent past... <laughs> But now it's making me not confident that I – because I hung this sweatshirt back up. But I thought I had washed it, but maybe not. I think I have some of uh, Portland's Holy Donut on here. That sounded perverted. But the potato donuts from Portland. Yum. I want people to call my vagina a Holy Donut. (laughs) The Holy Donut. (laughs) I have some of Sabrina's Holy Donut on me. I have glaze on my sleeve from a Holy Donut. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds awful. I love it. Uh, but the chocolate coconut from Holy Donut, it's the best. They're potato donuts from Portland, Maine. Talked about them plenty of times on the podcast. Obsessed with them. Think about mm-hmm. them all the time. Was in Portland visiting our my friends Tally and Taylor. Brian and I went up for a night and their dog Arlo, who I'm obsessed with. Mm. I think about him all the time. But then we went to the Holy Donut. They were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, the only thing I ever want yeah. to do, like my only to do is to go to the Holy Donut. I will say I'm really glad that I now know what the Holy Donut is and have experienced the Holy Donut so that I can talk about it and not just listen to you speak about it. And now I can yeah. enjoy the now moment. Now you're a participant. And my mouth salivates as I think about it and get envious of the fact that you had it. Actually, well, Sabrina, I You could it. be in on all of the stuff if you move here. Like you could experience all the things I experience because I share them with you when you're here. You're reminding me so much right now of my cousin Lainey, who every summer she comes back from Spain and she says, I'm moving back to America. I'm just going to make the move in December when I'm halfway through the school year. Then she goes back to Madrid and within one week she's like, yeah, I'm not coming back. And it's every year. And every year I've believed her. This is but the she probably one year it. that I have not. She means it in the moment. It's just, it's just, we're human and our brains change and do things differently. And I feel like I don't even know what this topic is really that you're going to talk to us about today, but I feel like this is all warming ourselves up for that conversation because it's like, also, can you tell I'm very childlike today? (laughs) Just spinning in your chair. I mean, I think if we had spinny chairs to record in, I think we'd spin in them all the time. I will say this might be the move. Is there like a bird cage or something next to you? What's Yes, happening? I did put I was going to not address it. I just wanted to add something ominous into <laughs> the <laughs> put no mummy in there, a caged child. <laughs> That's actually where my mom keeps me at night. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Is it a dog crate? Is that what it is? So my mom fosters and she uses my what is or was my brother's room as like the kitten room. So it's mm-hmm. a cat cage also what if we had swivel chairs and we could do this ready we did hello this is two girls one ghost it would work so well for the like three people that watch on youtube (laughs) (laughs) for everyone else they'd be like 
It sounds like they're inconsistent with their microphones and their voices. You know what? It's not for you. It's for me. And it always has just been for us. We're selfish. This is exactly why I won't go and listen to previous episodes of the podcast because I'm like, what the fuck was I even saying back then? Oh, yeah. It's been so long, too, that I'm like, I'm going to be horrified at the way I covered certain topics. So I'll never go back. If I ever go to grad school to study psychology, which is also another thing that I've wanted to do because we're human and there's a lot of you things in the world. You can match me. We can have matching degrees. Yeah. I would love to do a thesis on myself and in <laughs> review of myself via the podcast and my psychological digression, regress, regression, regression, because I definitely went through a mental breakdown. And um, honestly, I feel like I might be doing one right now. Yeah, Sabrina, let me tell you one thing. You'll be in good company because that's you and pretty much everyone else in a clinical psych program. They like put you through group counseling. Everybody shares their deepest, darkest secrets. It's like trauma treatment. It It, it is, but you come out with a degree in the end. <laughs> you get a certificate. You get to walk on stage. It is funny because I did feel like trauma treatment was school. Like I took notes on different types of psychological like treatments and different techniques and things. I was taking mm -hmm. notes and yes, I was using it and trying to apply it to myself, but I really right. do feel like it was kind of like school. It is. And I paid a heft, a pretty penny. So it basically was as expensive. It might've been more expensive to be honest. I think it was a lot of grad school programs. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is exciting. We'll see what path chooses you, Sabrina. And this is a good time to say that this episode is going to be a little bit different from our previous episodes. We usually talk about the paranormal. We usually talk about ghosts and demons and goblins and haunted houses. But this time I thought, you know, let's make this a little bit more of a feel-good episode. We're going to talk about a topic that has been coming up in social media quite a bit, and it all pertains to love and connection and trusting in the universe. So we're going yeah, a little I need to woo -woo. learn how to do that. I love woo woo. Well, so remember I like wrote this episode and then I was like, wait, actually, maybe I shouldn't tell you this episode. <laughs> like maybe I shouldn't read this to you. And you're like, I can handle it because I'm going through shit. Okay. But I re I reworded some stuff to be less harsh and direct <laughs> so that we can live within the fluff <laughs> and just enjoy it. Right now in this very moment, I'm in an okay place so I can okay. handle it. All right, so we're going to talk about the invisible string theory, which if there are any people out there that are Swifties or if they're on TikTok, they might recognize that name. But it's been making its rounds on the internet once more. The invisible string theory is basically like a theory that the universe is stitched together by these unseen threads. And basically you're connected to everyone who you'll ever need in your life, people who yeah. should meet in our lives. Like we have this invisible tether to them and whether we it's like fate now and destiny or in 40 years exactly it totally is and when i was reading about it i did realize that like to some people it can feel very overwhelming this idea because it does pull into question a bit of like you know when you talk about fate and you talk about destiny you're also considering like well do i have free will like do i get to choose what people come into my life like what what the fuck is happening why right. does it is feel everything so predetermined predestined because if it is yeah. that's scary because it feels like then you have no control of your life totally but it's not okay so the invisible string theory is not supposed to be about that although like i feel like it anything when you talk about stuff like this where it does kind of like feel a little bit more woo-woo feel a little bit more hypothetical and kind of like up in space you can connect it to so many different things so some people feel like that but it's not supposed to be about it it's supposed to be about the people or the things or the places that are meant to be in your life coming into your life exactly when you need it. Most of the conversation is about romantic partners because it's one of those things, you know, like when we're all young, we're like, oh, don't you just wish you had an envelope delivered to your door when you're like 18 and it says what age you'll be when you meet your your soulmate or whatever. And so I feel like we <laughs> we fall back on the invisible string theory when talking about sure. lovers. I do have a question. How is it? How is it appearing in social media? Because as someone who is not like up to date with trends and stuff, I'm curious how it's been in the like social cycle, because I, despite my not being up to date on things, I have seen 
all the videos about like men or women being like, so my partner says that they manifested me, which is like weird to think about. Like, did they practical magic spell conjure me when they were young? Oh, no, it hasn't been that. But that's reminding me of my vows to Brian, where I literally was like me and my grandma manifested Brian because <laughs> it was like her wish list and my wish list is literally just him. So that's amazing. No. So there's I mean, there's a few like trending sounds or whatever that go with this. Most people are talking about how they met like their boyfriends, their girlfriends, their wives, husbands, whatever. But then there's another side of the invisible string theory on TikTok where there's this audio that's like, well, you don't know me but I know you. And it's like a little bit creepy. And the invisible string theory has found itself in that audio, but it's a little bit less about romantic partners and more about like weird situations, like how people found their house, how people found their pet. Mm. Like, is their great, great grandma now their child? (laughs) Stuff like that. How can you talk about this without talking about fate and free will and destiny? Because I know it's hard. I mean, we're going to get woo-woo and I know you have a lot to say, but like al- already my brain is going to time and how it functions. And when like kind of like everything everywhere all at once, mm-hmm. different decisions like sprouting off and creating different invisible strings like in, yeah. in realities. Anyway, totally. I'll let you continue. Well, that is why it's such a weird and kind of scary. It, it's convoluted, but basically... The premise of it is the universe is playing matchmaker in some sort of way. And it's also playing therapist. It's delivering the people that you need or the interventions or opportunities that you need in that moment at the right time and no sooner. So Mm -hmm. in the example of romantic partners, it could be something where it's like you cross paths for many years. You never speak. You're going to the same grocery store. Maybe you belong to the same yoga studio. You take the same vacation. You're sitting on the same airplane. You've crossed paths so many times. Maybe you find out later on when you're looking at photos from your childhood that your partner was in the background. They were at the same park during your fifth birthday. Stuff like that where it was like you had so many opportunities to meet each other, but you didn't because it wasn't the right time for you to meet. I feel like that applies also to like friendships, like, you know, you and I, for example. Totally. And this doesn't extend to just romantic partners. Like it can be mentors. It can be friends. It can be children, pets, objects, any type of relationship. And I feel like we can all relate to that. I mean, I'll say all as in you and I, because I've definitely met certain people where it feels like I've known them for a really long time Mm -hmm. beyond just this life. There's one person who... You're going to hate this. It's from our college experience together. Oh, do I know who it is? Yeah. You're like freshman year. Relationship, yeah. Relationship, yeah. But it was so wild because immediately upon meeting him, and granted, I'm going to preface this by saying it was like the most toxic, unhealthy relationship, and I only (laughs) dated him for like a month and he cheated on me the entire time. But- Oh, to be 18 again. (laughs) Right. But when I met him, it was like this weird connection- we were literally born in the same exact hospital three days apart. So we were in the hospital together. Wait, I didn't know this. Yeah. That's so bizarre because I didn't realize that he was born in New Jersey because it's, mm-hmm. he grew up in LA. Yeah, but he spent some time because his birth parents were from New Jersey. Yeah. And then his uncle and aunt who he went to live with had a home in New Jersey. So like even like in the the summer between like freshman and sophomore year, like wow. I saw him. We had a lot of crossover. It was really weird. That is weird. And then it makes me th- like I'm scratching my head now because I'm like, well, <laughs> were you brought together at the right time? <laughs> I think in the sense that like I think we were brought together not like, not at the right time, but it was just an interesting like serendipity of being brought together despite having crossed paths so many times. Yeah. And it was a really intense relationship that – didn't serve me long term, but I do think taught me a lot. Yeah. Well, there you go. And also like with the invisible string theory, it doesn't mean that someone's going to be in your life forever. It could be that they just in a really intense short period of time, they serve you what you need to learn to grow Mm -hmm. in that moment. Or it could also just be that these people or these items, these opportunities, they keep finding their way back to you over and over again until you have the opportunity and the confidence to figure out what that like clarity is that you need from that situation. Actually, you know, what's wild. I just realized this. Well, no, I didn't just realize this, but in this moment, I'm really like fully able to like 
put it into words, that relationship actually made me address my trauma from high school for the very first time. Mm. And also I'll add, weren't you, because I remember you talking about your beliefs in marriage at that time too. Was that the yeah, relationship? I didn't believe in love, didn't believe yeah. in marriage. And I feel like that one cracked cracked you a little bit. Mm. <laughs> I still I still didn't believe in love and marriage at that point. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, he helped in some way. <laughs> he did. He he helped me address things that I needed to address. Yeah. So with the invisible string theory, everyone who has touched your life in some way or will be there when you need them most is connected to you by an invisible string. And the theory relates back to this Chinese mythology. And really, it's like an Eastern Asian mythology because it changes a little bit based on geographically where you are in East Asia. But Mm -hmm. primarily in the Chinese mythology, there is this red thread of fate. And red represents happiness and luck. And this is basically like the backstory is there was this old lunar matchmaker who tied two people's ankles together, and now they were destined to be lovers. And then throughout many of the different Asian cultures, the backstory changes ever so slightly about like how these people met, how they believed in their meeting, who brought them together, how they're tethered together. But a lot of times they are bound by a red thread holding their fingers together. Mm. So the message stays the same. It's like, Regardless of what you think, if you're told at five years old on the playground that this is your future wife and you're like, ah, I don't believe that, and you throw a rock at her. She has cooties. 30 years later, you meet your future wife and she has a scar from a kid throwing a rock at her on the playground when she was five. Interesting. Okay. So in the theory, the cord may stretch, it may tangle, but it will never break. So you might grow up next door to the person you're meant to be with, but then live in Taiwan for 20 years. And that Mm -hmm. is stretching your thread. And then you might randomly move to, I don't know, Toronto. And that person also randomly moves to Toronto. And it's like Mm -hmm. you come back together. You might cross paths a bunch. You might tangle. You might meet. And maybe it didn't feel like anything at the moment. But when it's meant to, you will know. It's almost like an elastic band in a way. It has this stretch that allows you the freedom to move about. But eventually you have to like the elasticity returns Mm -hmm. and you bounce to them. And you just snap back and then you chest bump and you're like, are we in love? (laughs) Are we soulmates? This feels right. (laughs) So Taylor Swift, she does have a song. I feel like I've talked about Taylor Swift a lot for not being a Swifty, but she has a song that came out a few years ago in 2020 called Invisible String. And basically, it's talking about, I listened to it, I think, for like the first time this morning. And there's the lyrics, and isn't it just so pretty to think all along there was some invisible string tying you to me? Mm. But the lyrics are, it's not quite as dead on as the invisible string theory, because in her lyrics, she'll be like, I used to sit at this one park, and the park's grass was green. And your favorite sweater that you wore when you were 16 was also green. And it's like, okay, well, that's not that's not That's a stretch. That's a stretch. And maybe she meant it to be kind of, I don't don't know. I didn't dive into the Swifty lore or the meaning behind her songs or who it was written about. (laughs) But whoever or whatever's meant to be in your life is always going to find a way back to you when it's needed. And the most important thing about the invisible string theory from what I read was When the moment is right, when you're meeting the right person, whether it be a favorite teacher, a best friend, a mentor, or a significant other, it will not feel hard. It will not feel forced. It will not leave you drained or disappointed. It won't leave you confused and questioning, well, is this person supposed to be in my life? What if the timing is just off? You will feel so intensely in your soul that it is the right place at the right time, the right person. And if you feel that it's not, then it's not meant to be. And you just are supposed to let that like friendship, that connection pass through you. See, that's the thing that I struggle with the most in my life is as someone who has dealt with, I think this is something like all humans can relate to, whether or not you've Mm -hmm. been through trauma, the ability to trust your own instincts and decipher your feelings versus your logic versus like gut. Yes. And that is what I struggle with. I know. Because I can spiral and overthink something 
to fucking death. Yeah, I feel like I have experienced that too. But at the on the flip side, I can be so spontaneous. <laughs> where like, if I decide something, like there's so many examples of it where it's like, if I decide that I'm moving to Massachusetts, I'm fucking moving to Massachusetts. Like, I'll think on something for two days. And if it feels right, that's it. And even if it takes me a year to get there, like I'm still doing it. See, I, I do that when it's things that don't impact anyone else, like dyeing my hair pink. Just do did it, it with, yeah. within a week. But if it impacts right. or involves someone else, I will. Because I'm a people Spiral. pleaser yeah. to, a, to a toxic degree. Well, yeah. And there is, I feel like, I mean, I've told you this before, that when I was in L.A., I was helped so much as a person to like grow and make decisions and kind of like trust my instinct when I moved to Massachusetts because I didn't like who I was when I lived in Los Angeles. I didn't like the yeah. choices that I was making, the people that I was bringing into my life around me. And I Except feel for like, me. Excuse me. Well, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think there's plenty of friends that I, I'm specifically talking about like dating lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. And there was just a lot of like I went from having like generally a pretty – healthy example of a relationship with my parents and them talking to me growing up about like what a good romantic partner would look like to throwing all of that out the door when I was in California and being like, well, I'm healthy and I'm healed and I'll fix you. And I like just totally damaged myself so much and would talk myself out of yeah. things and be like, well, I have to be the person that stays because I can't hurt them. And I have to show them that like they can be loved and they will find. And it was just so, so horrible. And so when I moved to Massachusetts, I was, I spent so much time thinking about like who I wanted to be as a partner, what sort yeah. of bad traits I'd picked up or things that I didn't like about the way that I acted in relationships. And I basically allowed, I was so cutthroat with myself. I would allow myself like one slip up. And then if I did that, I would like sit in it for like weeks and think about yeah. it and be like, never again. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again. But it was very cutthroat. Like my my dating life was very fucking cutthroat out here. Cause I was right. like, I won't, I won't let myself slip into the waffling that I experienced so much of when yeah. I was in California. But I and could only do easy. that when I like ripped myself away from all other influences. Yeah. And that's it's not like, easy. Not you do easy. have to like you kind of put yourself into an uncomfortable position, but then you have no distraction or ability to like evade those feelings and those yeah. thoughts and those desires. And also just, this is a note to anyone who's listening. And I think it's so much easier for me to like impart this to others than it is for me to enact or apply into my own life. But it is not your job to fix anyone else. It is your job no. to focus on yourself and a good partner should be able to prioritize themselves and you. They should be able to do both and they should not be sucking and draining the energy from you. No. I'm like remembering the, the time in college that someone walked up to me and said, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And they're like, you look dead. And it was at like a really peak horrible time in a relationship that I had because I was getting drained. I was like, I looked gray. Like I was dying. <laughs> Vampires are real. They just don't yeah. always sink their teeth into you. That's so true. Which is so tough when it's like talking about the invisible string through you're supposed to trust in the universe and go with the flow and everything like the right thing will happen at the right time. But it's like, okay, you don't just sit and get taken down this like lazy river of life though. Like you still have to make the choices and the choices are presented in front of you and you're supposed to like trust your gut and go with it and then kind of thank the universe for for giving that opportunity to you. But at the same time, it's like, well, you, you're still the one making the choices, which is so yeah, hard. Yeah, you have to be an active participant as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, you can't <gasps> take over my life, Corinne, and just Sims manage me because that would be ideal. I know. It would <laughs> Instead of Jesus take the wheel, it's Corinne take the wheel. And I, I feel like I do a decent job only because... You and I, I've known you for so long and you've told me so many times what you want. And I think that I I could help you. I know. And I, I would love for you to. But that's only because I've also been in a situation where I probably needed someone to control me. And unfortunately, that's not how life works. And you need to go through it on no. your own. And you but you don't need me. You know, you know what you need to know. 
If you heard that, that was me hitting my head with a microphone. You want me to control you because you don't want to make the choices that you know you need to make. And that is the lesson of the episode. (laughs) Okay, you can turn your chair around and I'll continue. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay, but part of the invisible string theory is that you're not supposed to dismiss the things or the people that present themselves and it kind of feels like it fell into your lap too. So like when things do feel really easy, I think sometimes I'm totally this personality where I can be like, well, maybe I should ignore that because that seems like it came too easy to me and I didn't work really hard to get that Mm -hmm. and I didn't kill myself over this and so I don't deserve this. And that's not the way you're supposed to think about this. Like when you're delivered these things. It's also tough because it's like, this isn't a way or an excuse to say, don't work hard at things. Don't Mm -hmm. like push yourself to an extreme to get the things that you want and need. Because like you even said, Corinne, you went through a lot of trials and tribulations and hard times. And then there were moments where things came to you more easily, but you had to go through all of that hard stuff in order for something to come to you more easily. Yeah. It's hard to be like, yeah, and I was trusting in the universe because I wasn't. I was so in my head. Yeah. I mean, I was trusting that eventually I'd get there, but it wasn't like, oh, yeah, sit back, relax, enjoy all these horrible dates and (laughs) harsh truths about yourself that you hate and are going to work on changing with your little manifestation and spirituality walks every day. No, that was, it wasn't easy. And growth isn't. It's not. And we're also only 30. So there's going to be so much more of toughness when we think of our lives and, you know, the longevity of our lives. Hopefully we have a long life. There are going to be a lot more trials and tribulations we go through. Yeah. And people change and grow so much. It's yeah. like even if I think about like what who we were when we first started the podcast, it's so different. So yeah. e- even a couple of years ago, so different. So this is like always something that happens. It's not like the universe is just like, here's your path. Here's your job. Here's your best friend. Here's your partner. Life is beautiful and rainbows and butterflies. I wish it's- it was MASH. <laughs> I do. You're going to live in a shack. You're going to have 107 kids, but you're going to drive a Ferrari and your husband sells hot dogs. (laughs) That's that's what MASH is giving you. And his name is Nick Jonas. That hot dog money gets the Ferrari. (laughs) Or better yet, maybe his name is Drake after all that stuff that just uh, surfaced. About his hot dog? About his hot dog. Hot (laughs) dog. People will line up at that hot dog stand. I honestly say that hot dog stand might scare me. I didn't look. <laughs> it's intimidating. I don't need to know. I think people described it enough that I I, I visualize it. I You've seen I a know. hot dog. Yeah, you I've can, seen you one. can get it. Once you yeah. see one, you can uh, envision what the rest look well, like. Well, sometimes. Sometimes. Which is not true of vaginas. They're That's so true. different. So they many are. different shapes and sizes. Well, penises also too are all and discoveries within the folds. They're all they're all like very they're... strange. You know what I I love as I've gotten older. We've talked about this before, but the American Girl doll book I feel like made mm-hmm. you think everything about your body was incorrect because it was all about like it didn't talk about the di- diversity of vaginas or boobs or nipple hair. And as no. I've gotten older, that's something that I've understood, but I didn't know that growing up. Right. The first time I figured out that it was so different was literally in college in my human sexuality class when they had us look at this sculpture that was this artist took molds of like 50 women's different like labias, basically like the outside and just made this like beautiful mural out of it. It was like a concrete sort of situation. But I was like, what in the world? There's one out of all of these that I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I thought that they all looked like. (sighs) And then I went to a strip club so I could see in real life. Is it different? (laughs) It was a scientific experiment. (laughs) And how did we get here? (laughs) Because we're talking about the universe and love. (laughs) We got here from hot dogs being sold in Uh, mash. That's how we got here. But you know what? If we believe in invisible string theory, we needed to have this conversation in order to get back. It all, yes, exactly. Without this, how would we ever move forward? We couldn't because <laughs> the thought would be in our mind and it would be sabotaging us. And the next words we would say would be exactly, it would be gibberish. Life would be altered so drastically had we not talked about the variety of hot it dogs would. and labias. Well, for all those hot dog and labia lovers out there, 
here's something good about the invisible string theory. I think a lot of it is good, but it yeah. does say, so if you're someone like what we've talked about, where like we've had moments in our past and in our present where we start to waffle and say like, is this the right decision? Are we making the right choices? This feels impossible because if I make this choice, I have these consequences, that choice, these consequences, and it feels really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. From what I saw and read about this theory, if you are rejecting the paths that you're meant to take and the clear signs that the universe, what the universe considers as clear to you, it does not mean that you're missing them. The universe will adjust. The timing will come back around. People who you're meant to have connections with will find their way back to each other. And yeah. when you know, you know, it'll feel powerful. But most of all, it will feel very spooky. So I wanted to get into some of the moments that people have shared online, moments that seem just a little bit too unlikely to be coincidence. So people are saying, well, they must be these invisible strings. Well, we've even read so many listener stories. There's one specifically that I remember where a woman had a dream of a woman she had never seen before. And it, like she was telling her something. And mm -hmm. Then she met her partner based on like something that happened in that dream. And when she was with the partner, she saw a photo of his deceased mother and it was the woman from her dream. Oh, gosh. See, those things give me chills. And then I there know. is such a crossover with it's like, OK, invisible string theory. It's all about like destiny and these strings connecting you. But then I'm also like, well, what is the role of spirit intervention? Like what if it was his mother or grandmother, whoever it was? trying to bring them together like what is predetermined by the universe's like quote unquote strings and what is just our right. loved ones and spirits trying to kind of like play matchmaker a little bit but can't both exist at the same time where it's like this string exists and our relatives on the other side are like you keep missing the signs like you're saying that sometimes you miss the signs and the universe brings mm -hmm. them back and the loved ones is like you know what i'm not gonna wait i'm just gonna give a little bit of a tap tap on the booty shove you in the right direction yeah this is making me think of, do you remember the episode in The Good Place where they're trying desperately to have Chidi and Kristen Bell's character meet and fall in love, I think, oh, in the yeah. real world? Yeah. But they can't. They're constantly like just, it's just not working, bumping into each other but ignoring each other immediately. There's no right. like, whoa, I'm flooded with emotion and feeling like we're destined to be together. Right. Oh, I loved that show. That was such a good show. Me too. Okay, so here are some examples that I saw people share online about themselves. So there's this couple, Chloe and Marcus. They are now married. They're a Bumble success story, so an online dating success story. And while the two met on the dating app and then got married two years later, they just did not realize at the time how connected their lives were until it started to like unfold in conversations over time mm -hmm. and exposed how many times their paths had crossed before. Wow. For example, both Chloe and Marcus separately took vacations to Los Angeles. When they were on vacation in Los Angeles, they bought tickets and attended the same magic show. And you're like, okay, well, there's a bunch of shows, you know, like maybe people have this. They had both had an interest in going and seeing a magic show. Sure. After the magic show, they walked the strip. All right, people do that. But then they stopped in front of the same fountain, which I'm going to assume is the Bellagio fountain. And then mm. they took pictures of themselves. So not only did these two strangers have the exact same vacation itinerary, but what's extra spooky is they were literally on vacation at the exact same time, were sitting in the exact same magic show, walked the strip as strangers at the exact same time, and then both on opposite sides of this fountain had someone take a picture of them at the same time. Did they see each other in the photos? No. I think it was only after when they had like looked back at photos and were talking about the trips that, that they yeah. realized exactly wow. when it happened. But this was not the first time that they had a close encounter, a missed meet cute. Marcus also lived on the same road as Chloe's best friend growing up. And her brother took karate at the same studio where Marcus taught because I think there was like a six year age difference or something like that. Okay. They also attended many of the same political protests. And so for decades, these two, they were like just circling each other's lives, coming so close together, but so never wild. actually meeting. And then when it was finally time for them to meet, they did through a dating app online. <laughs> and then they fell in love. That is so cool. I know, isn't it? And the timing was perfect. And Chloe had said that they're basically, she was like, the timing could not have been more perfect because if they had met 
at any of the other opportunities that they had these like meet cutes, it wouldn't have worked out because there were other factors that would have prevented them from feeling this connection to each other or like exploring a relationship because they'd both been in different relationships in the past. Also, there was an age difference. So like, for example, when Chloe's best friend's brother was taking karate lessons where Marcus taught, like Marcus was an adult. <laughs> Chloe was like 15. That would have right, right. never happened. So it, Which is it good really... that it didn't happen then. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad. Yes. yes. And Chloe had said, quote, when we did meet, we were both in the right place in our lives and we'd done the work required to be in a good state of mind to be in a successful relationship. So whether that's fate or it's a happy coincidence, I'm very into it. So I do yeah. like that idea too, where it's like two people can be in such different places in their lives. Like, I mean, let's think of Chloe as a 15-year-old and him as like a 22-year-old. Like their emotional intelligence, their life experience, everything's going to be so different. And yeah. until they kind of like match that sort of like same experience and vibration and desire, they're not brought together because it wouldn't right. work until they both are at right. complementary levels. Which is also then like another offshoot of the invisible string theory where it's like each person that you meet is helping you deal with and in experience life so you can learn xyz lesson so that when you meet the right person you are in a place where you can nurture and experience that relationship in the way that you're meant to totally totally which it does like it's so hard to get through researching this and also just like talking about it because it just there's so much reflection I think involved in this too yeah. where you start to think about like all the moments and all the people that helped you in your life and like changed your perspective on things even the bad things you know yeah which is very hard to sometimes like come to terms with mm -hmm. but there are a lot of things that I've experienced in my life that I wish didn't happen and I would prefer no one ever experience, but yeah. it has also formed who I am as a person. And ultimately, despite like all my ups and downs, I do love myself and I love who I am. Yes. And I don't think I would Good. be me without all of my experiences. Right. And it's also hard thinking back to the bad things that have happened too, because like certain relationships or certain people, you can feel such anger and resentment towards people. And some people rightly deserve it. But at other times, like I've thought about myself and how I've represented myself to other people. And I'm like, man, people probably have thought that I was like this evil witch in the past. And it's like you never know what sort of death of self moment someone else is going through and and why yeah. they're behaving a certain way. And it is – yeah, it's this theory does promote a lot of compassion and forgiveness. I agree. And I think that's the most important thing in life is empathy. You yeah. never know what other people are going through. Totally. Yeah. Another example, if we're going to continue with some of the romantic invisible string examples, is this girl named Savannah. She shared online that when she was eight years old, she randomly started calling herself Savannah Park, which that was not her last name, but she just had to call herself Savannah Park. And years later, she meets her boyfriend, who she's been with for a long time now, and his last name is Park. And three years into their relationship, they figured out that he was playing in a – he would play these uh, little league football games that Savannah's family would attend. She must have had like a brother or someone who also played these games. But she did not call herself Savannah Park because she saw him and was like, wow, the boy on the other team is so cute. She was just like simply there and picking up on some energy in the air and gave wow. herself the nickname Savannah Park. Did you ever give yourself a nickname that has like come back to your life? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Have you? No. Well, Charlie is the name that like I like. I love that name for a girl so oh. much. And when I write characters, not all of them, of course, because I can't name everyone the same character. But and <laughs> it's then, like when I when named I'm, all like, my all my fish and hermit crabs Alexa Vega. Everyone gets yeah. to be Alexa Vega. <laughs> but it hasn't come back in my life necessarily. Mm. I mean, my brother's girlfriend is Charlotte, but I don't think she's ever been called Charlie. Maybe you'll have a daughter and you'll name her Charlie. Maybe. Okay, you saying that, I guess there is an example. And it was the name Athena. Like growing up, I always said I was going to name my child Athena. And then when I was 16, and I'd been saying that for like years and years, and my parents were like, you're not Greek. Like you're, you're not <laughs> name your child Athena. But then when I was 16, I went to Santa Cruz, California to a mystical metaphysical shop that no longer exists. And 
had a past life and tarot card reading and the woman kept her eyes closed the entire time. I told you about this and yeah. me and my friend Olivia had gone together and it was just like so spot on for both of us. And she had said towards the end of the reading that I had a spirit guide named Athena. And I was like, that is so weird because that's out of all the names, <laughs> out of right. all the names. Yes. Wild. Also, just to clarify, I, now that I've had a moment to think about it, I definitely will not name my child Charlie because Charlie is my drunk alter ego. And I don't think yes. I could impart that. <laughs> yeah, you have said that onto before. a child. Yeah, you you had too many <laughs> too many memories associated with that name that when you look at yeah. the purity and loveliness of a of a wee baby, you're like of a wee lass. Man, you're better off never experiencing some of these things. Yeah, better off never meeting Charlie. To be honest, mm -hmm. actually, Charlie's fun. <laughs> Charlie's a great time. She is. Charlie climbs trees and lights things on fire. That's June. Oh, shit. <laughs> I can't keep track of them, Sabrina. <laughs> There's many versions of me. Oh, that's June. Okay. Yeah, June is June wears only black clothing. June's a Halloween character. If you haven't heard of June, go back to the early days of the podcast. It's it's something that was conjured up within me or something that possessed me. I think it was our junior year of college. Yeah. I don't uh, Yeah. I don't remember. It's all a blur. And honestly, I don't remember a few years of college because I had a drinking problem. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> like, I, well, I laughed because I was uncomfortable because I didn't know how to uh, address it. Yes. No, I also <laughs> agree and think that I had a similar problem. So I guess. We it. all were. No one could help each other with their drinking problems or like intervene because we all had them. And it wasn't yeah. like a normal. I mean, oh, funny. Everyone's getting drunk at a college party. Like it was bad. No, but, I don't think the way that we drink, most people in society drink in college is healthy at all. No. I mean, it still affects me today. This is why I don't really drink anymore because I Yeah. And I think that's a great part of your journey bad. and I'm really proud of you for acknowledging that, Corinne. Thanks. Yeah. I'm only allowed one sip of alcohol every like six months. <laughs> okay. One of my favorite stories that was shared online was just one line. It was like in the comment section of another video. And this woman named Claudia said, quote, my husband and I both remember being at a pedestrian crossing one day and just staring at each other for a good 10 seconds a few years before we met. So it's like they both knew that there was something with the other person, but not right now. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories like that where people work in the same building and like see each other in the elevator and like make such intense eye contact. And mm -hmm. when they finally do communicate or acknowledge one another's existence they both will say like the first time I saw you in the elevator I like had this insane intense connection to you and I just like yeah. didn't know what to do with it which is so beautiful that people experience that without saying anything like you can truly right. connect to someone's soul by looking at their eyes you just know yeah it's kind of like with friends or people too like there's certain people where you're just like it's so easy and it feels easy immediately and it does feel like you've known each other for a long time yeah so a couple more examples in the romantic field, and then we'll move on. But I saw one person had said that she carried around a $2 bill in her pocket for good luck. And when she met her partner, he also had been carrying around a $2 bill for good luck. And they realized that each of their $2 bills had the other person's initial on it. And then even spookier, there was another example of someone who carried around this like, I think it was just like a $1 bill or something like that in his wallet but like the corner of it had a tear like it had been torn and then when he met his girlfriend in the future she also had the, the missing piece she just like randomly picked up like a torn piece of a dollar bill off of the ground and for some reason kept it that's so weird to me isn't it i can chills thinking about it but and then also like these are such like clear examples but to anyone who's out there and listening and is like, well, I didn't have this with my partner. You don't need to have all of these little connections. No. If These are like extreme examples that help back up this theory. Right. But you don't need to have the other half of their dollar bill or, you know, in order for you to be each other's person. Absolutely. And I think things can come like you can discover things. Maybe you don't know that you had a moment like this for 40 years either. Right. You know, like things can unfold, things can show themselves. And 
The invisible string theory doesn't mean that every single person who's important to you in your life has to be connected to you by a string. It's just there are certain people who are predestined to come into your life to help you with certain things. Yeah. And I'm like fully woo-woo on this conversation. And I like, Mm -hmm. I really do believe in the power of people who come into your life. But there is this weird psychological aspect of this where is this the human condition where we so desperately need there to be purpose that we make these connections? And that's not to say that they don't exist, but is this just the way that we need to process experiences in order to make sense of them? Or when something happens that just seems so statistically low, we have to assign some sort of spiritual... I guess, like meaning to them because it just feels too weird to have experienced otherwise. Right. And then it's also really hard. And and this will be the la- the only like downer of a thing that I say, but kind of similar to like some of the experiences I went through, which I would never wish upon anyone when really, really horrendous things happen to anyone in the world, like a loss of a loved one. Like I'm mm-hmm. thinking specifically like death and those types of tragedies. It does make you question like, well, why would that happen to me? And so that right. is hard to sometimes process, but that's the only sad thing I will say. And we can go return to love because that's much more pleasant. But I mean, maybe that person that you loved so much in your life that did pass, like they were in your life so that you could have that connection and that feeling with them prior. I know. Death is a horrible yeah. subject. And yeah, it's one that finds its way into every episode that we have because... Because ghost stories. Death, you have no ghosts. You have no ghosts. All right, well, let's move on to some examples that have nothing to do with romance and everything oh. to do with just weird connections in the universe. Okay. A man named Yarian, he had this little denim jacket as a baby. He grew up in Tennessee, and I think he had just one brother that was older. But one of the outfits that his mom had purchased for him as a baby was this little denim jacket. And she wrote on the tag, she wrote Yarian, you know, on the little like Levi oh. tag or whatever it was, you yeah. know, to identify if they lost it it's or if his. they brought it somewhere. Yeah. Like that's Yarian's jacket. Yeah. And he was really small when he was wearing this too. So it was probably, I would assume he only fit in that thing for like maximum six months. <laughs> At some point, as is what happens to a lot of people's childhood belongings, the jacket gets donated. Mm-hmm. 24 years later. He is in Wasilla, Alaska, and his wife is thrifting baby clothes. So he wore this jacket when he was a baby in Tennessee. They're now in Alaska. She's looking for items for their first son. And she finds this little denim jacket, and inside is a very faded Yarian written on the tag. And she freaks out, and she's so excited to show him. And when she showed him, the two realized, like, yes, this is Yarian's jacket, which is so weird but already so weird. But what's weirder is Yarian found a photo of him wearing the jacket, like sitting next to his brother. And in this photo, he's just a wee baby wearing the denim jacket and he has this little knit cap on. And literally a few days before his wife found this jacket at the thrift store in Alaska, his mom, so her mother-in-law, in anticipation of their first baby, gave her this very same knit cap as a gift. That he was wearing in this photo. So the entire outfit was collected within a couple days. Which the jacket itself is weird enough, but then the knit cap is even weirder, Mm -hmm. especially with how fashion evolves and changes. And yes, it like gets recycled. Absolutely. But like it's too specific. It's too specific. And it's so weird. It's like the whole outfit found its way back to him to welcome his first son, which also makes me think like. You know, we keep talking about the universe and like, oh, the the paths and the stars and the strings. And But who bought this outfit? Was it his mom or was this like mm-hmm. the grandmother or something who's since right. passed and is like, well, I want my that outfit that I got Yari in. I want to give it to his son. Like what is the – what's the line between it truly being like the invisible string theory and spirit intervention? Right. But how and different it the are those two? Thing? Or, yeah, right. exactly. You know what this reminds me of? And I was just trying to look for the email and I couldn't find it. But they came on to our campfire stories and told us the story. And I'm so blanking on their name. And I'm really, really sorry. But one of our listeners had had a transplant. And 
was able yes. to have get information from the about the donor from the family all this stuff and was like thrifting and found a jacket yeah. with their name of the name of the donor do you remember I'm that i remember the name too was it like charlie or something like now i'm thinking it's charlie i thought it was like brie or something but i can't i couldn't find it i just searched transplant uh, in our inbox was it a lung transplant was it cystic fibrosis my memory's not gonna help us get there i don't think Oh, was it Tabor? It was Tabor. Tabor. It was Tabor. And I think we read their story. If not, then we should read it ASAP. <laughs> should I read it right now? Sure. Okay, this is from our listener Tabor, and it's called My Guardian Angel. Tabor shared this with us on a Campfire Stories, which I believe is one of the episodes that's on like our feed. I just don't know which one. Mm. I wanted to tell you about my happy encounter with my guardian angel, Brittany. Okay, so Brie, Brittany. So a little background on me. I am a 22-year-old double lung transplant patient. Good job, Corinne. We and both had bits and pieces. We got the email because our memories got, got, got small sections of that email. See? We share the brain cell. <laughs> I received my transplant on February 21st, 2019. I was born with a lung disease called cystic fibrosis, which attacks multiple parts of your body, but primarily fills your lungs with a thick mucus that makes it hard to breathe. Long story short, my lung function got down to 11%, which necessitated a transplant. Around October or November is when I started communicating with my donor family and started learning about my donor. Her name was Brittany. She was a mom of two great boys, a wonderful wife, and a daughter. Since learning about her, she's constantly on my mind, and I believe she's constantly showing herself to me. One particular instance that is the most incredible is when I was at a thrift store shopping around, as one does in any thrift store and I didn't find anything good. I slowly started to make my way to the front when I got a feeling that I had to go look at the jacket rack. I'm from North Carolina, and a hoodie or jacket is always good to have on hand. As I'm looking through the clothes, I see a varsity jacket peeking out. It was a black and yellow color combination, and I thought I should just look at it. When I grabbed it, I noticed the name on it, Brittany, in the exact spelling as she spelled her name. I've had some supernatural experiences happen to me before, but this felt the most surreal. I grabbed it, took it to the counter where I explained to the cashier its importance, and he was shocked. I immediately wore it home, which when getting things from a thrift shop isn't always the best idea, (laughs) but I've been in love with it ever since. I sent a picture of me wearing it to my donor dad, that's what I called Brittany's dad, and he loved it. I'm in North Carolina, and they're from Grafton, West Virginia, but I'm so excited to meet them. I just started your podcast from the beginning, and I love it. I hope to hear this on an episode once I catch up. Thanks, Tabor. I mean, this is just so incredible. It's Mm -hmm. so beautiful. And it also feels like not only did Tabor get another chance to live life a little more comfortably with the gift of her lungs, but it's it's almost like she's she's acknowledging that she is happy that it went to him, too, by, like, Mm -hmm. sending this sign. And it sounds like this isn't the only time that Brittany also, like, makes – herself known to Tabor. Mm -hmm. I just love that now Tabor has a jacket so that on the outside, Tabor can wear something that is also of Brittany. Because on the inside, Tabor already is, has Brittany. Yes. And it does make me wonder, because again, like it does happen to people where they get tissue or, you know, other organs or something transplanted. And there's different emotions and feelings or like moments of recognition of strangers that doesn't make sense for them in their lives, but would for the person who donated yeah. to them. Yeah. Whew. Beautiful. Man. All right. A few more, a few more examples. We have an example shared from a woman named Amy. She purchased a house in 2022. And we all know how house hunting can be. It can be very tough, very stressful. Mm-hmm. So she found this house, was super proud of it, super excited, felt right. Later on, she's looking through old family photos. And she finds a photo of her grandfather as a baby. Like he's like probably three years old. Mm -hmm. And he is standing on the lawn in front of this house. No. Yes. (laughs) That's wild. So crazy. And then the last example I'll give you is one that I picked out specifically for you, Sabrina, because of course it pertains to our pets, the invisible string theory does. I was like, where is this going? (laughs) Cats. That's where it's going. A man named Ace, he spoke about how his invisible string connection was to his cat, whose name is Blitz. 
Aww. Ace said that out of the blue, he got this really strong urge to go visit his childhood home, which he grew up in this apartment. And I don't think he'd been back to that complex in a really long time. And he just, it wasn't like he was reminiscing on anything and was like, oh, mm-hmm. maybe I should go see. It was just out of the blue, a sudden like, you should go see the apartment where you grew up. And so he didn't really know why he needed to go, but he was like, all right, I guess I'll respond to this overwhelming draw and drive over there. So he went. And when he got there, he kind of like walked around, walked out behind the apartment. And he said he was just so overwhelmed with the memories. And he just felt Mm -hmm. this like deep connection to his past. And it was like flooding all of his senses all at once. And he sits in it for a moment, takes it all in, and then he leaves. Two weeks later, he gets another similar feeling. He'd already been thinking like, oh, you know, maybe it's time that I go to the animal shelter and consider adopting an animal. But there's this feeling, this urge that hits him. And it And this urge is, you need to go to the animal shelter now. Like, there's no time better than the present to go get a cat. Mm -hmm. And so he goes to the shelter and he's talking to the woman who's running the shelter that day. And he's like, yeah, I think I'm interested in in a cat. And she's talking about some of the cats. And she's like, oh, but let me tell you about the most recent cat we just brought in. They're chatting about him. And Ace realizes that this cat was found and taken in behind his old apartment And this cat was found, like literally taken from the exact spot where Ace used to play and where he'd been flooded with all of these memories just two weeks before. And that's how the universe brought Ace and Blitz together. Which makes me wonder, was the cat, was there almost a moment where they connected in the backyard of that place? Or? (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. So interesting. But the fact that also, because I feel like it's rare when you're adopting a pet for them to know like the exact specifics of where they were found and their yeah. whole story. I mean, especially with strays, you know? Right. But the fact that they were able to relay this information so specifically about this cat, I, I mean, that's, I think that's beautiful. I know. It is. And it's almost like, yeah, was the cat picking up on all of these? Like, did the cat choose Ace? Or was the universe just trying to be like, okay, well, I know if you. Yeah. Come here and see a cat. You're not just going to pick it up. So that's not how I bring you together. But I have to give you a very clear sign that Blitz is supposed to be in your life. Yeah. How do you get more clear than that? You can't. Mm -mm. And it's like, that's the thing with the invisible string theory. It's so many of these things people are like, could this just be a wild coincidence? Because it just feels too coincidental to happen otherwise. Or is it just, is it just a crazy coincidence? I don't know. I guess we'll never really know until we are on the other side and yeah. we accept our roles as head of council <laughs> on the board of questions and answers. <laughs> the one thing we could never do in our life, suddenly we're being assigned as the head of in our mm-hmm. afterlife. <laughs> yeah. The irony. You know, and, and our only job is to absorb all the answers. We've searched for so long. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So you said that the invisible string theory, you do feel like there was a bit of that that happened with the freshman year person. Do you think there's been anything else? I feel that with a lot of people in my life, like uh, if not everyone. And I I do fully believe that people are brought into your life for specific reasons and you meet them at certain times to teach you certain lessons. And Mm -hmm. I do think there, there is a bit of danger in that too, where it's like, And again, it's like trusting your instinct and your gut. It's like you might meet someone, but it might be a temptation, an allure, like a luring thing that actually isn't part of your invisible string theory. And it's not supposed to be part of your life, but feelings and logic get mixed up. Yeah, it does. Well, that's why I think like one of the things with the invisible string theory is that it keeps saying like it's supposed to feel easy. There's not supposed to be any resistance. It's supposed to be. But then that that only really pertains to like a romantic partner who's good for you because then there's also people who come into your life to help challenge you to grow. It, it, uh, right. It's so hard. It is hard. I was thinking about it though when I was doing this research and I feel like I have maybe two-ish examples. But it's hard because it's like proximity plays a part of it. But my eighth grade boyfriend, Sumner, shout out Sumner. <laughs> He and I dated for like four months. And honestly, I think I felt Sumner was like one of my most serious relationships. <laughs> he was he, he was so nice. His family was so great. Everything was awesome. And then we uh, 
broke up when his really good friend and my friend because of dating seminar, Sam, had passed away. Mm. We're in eighth, in eighth grade. It was terribly difficult and emotional. But yeah. we had discovered once we started dating and also we met each other snowboarding and we didn't go to the same school. We weren't like in the same school district and we didn't have any mutual friends. We just like randomly met on the mountain. And then we realized that when we were like seven, we had been on the same swim team and there were photos of us in our like little Whoa, swim caps. <laughs> so I had that. Mm-hmm. And then I guess I was thinking about it with Brian because Brian and I have discussed that there were there were like a lot of moments where it was like weird that we we think we probably saw each other out in the world before. I'm sure. And like a good example of it is that we both lived in the same town outside of Boston. Like when I first moved to Boston, I didn't actually move to Boston. I moved near Boston because mm-hmm. it was more affordable. <laughs> And I would dog walk. I would pick up this dog that lived right behind Brian where Brian was renting. And so I would walk by Brian's place all the time. I probably saw him. But if we had ever met then, that was not the time to ever meet because he was in a very serious relationship at the time. And I was working on myself. Right. So and there were like there's some other examples with that, too. But it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, does proximity play a role in this? Because, you know. You know, Sumner and I, we weren't in the same school district, but we were, uh, our houses were a 30 minute drive apart. You know, Brian and I were in the same town and ended up living in the same city. Right. Is it just the space and the chances of running into someone or is it something more? Well, also, I think, I mean, again, I have not spent a ton of time studying or researching invisible string theory, but at least my comprehension of it is that it doesn't necessarily mean you've crossed paths in the past. It just means that you will and are meant to meet that person and have some type of connection, not necessarily from the past, but it could be current. And that like the experiences you've gone through in life have brought you together so that you can learn something from one another or even just like whether it's lifelong or temporary that you can impart something about what you've experienced in life to that person. Yeah. Which like, again, this is why it does feel kind of woo woo because it's like trust in the universe and everyone yeah. who's meant to be in your life will be. But then it, it's so convoluted because it's like, well, how do you pick apart these sort of things when they're not so blatantly obvious? Like, right. you know, Ace and his cat Blitz, like stuff like that. Right. And I also ask, because I spent a lot of time asking my spirit guides, my guardians for signs to like, acknowledge if I'm going in the right direction and they don't always give it to me or maybe I'm not seeing it and maybe I'm not ready to see it. I don't know, but it is really hard. And then this conversation becomes really cyclical because it's like, Mm -hmm. well, is it meant to be or is this the way that I'm processing and my experience as a human because it's really hard otherwise? I don't know. I guess if we think about the invisible string theory, the thing that can make making these choices a little bit less scary is that it does say if it's meant to be, it will come back to you, even if you skip it, even if you yeah. step on it, even if you try to burn it to the ground, it will find its way back to you if it's meant to be. If it's meant to be. It does take a little bit of that like risk in decision making away if you believe it. Right. Like you can make a decision now and you could change your mind or the universe will put it back in your in your path in order for you yes. to make a different decision the next time. And these are things that I'm trying to get to understanding. <laughs> and you will soon. But mm-hmm. the invisible string theory, although it's being talked about more recently in social media and it's like, you know, a Taylor Swift lyric, it has been <laughs> around for a while and it kind of has cloaked itself within other names. So in science, it can be referred to as cosmic string theory, which is a concept in theoretical physics that proposes okay. one-dimensional microscopic strings that branch out through the entire universe, and they were all formed at the time of the Big Bang. And if we relate it to two people, it's basically like these two strings influence each other, their vibrations are connected, they transcend physical space and manifest in various ways between those two people. Like it almost makes me think of twins, like when people are twins, because right. it talks a lot about like people having the same dream, people having synchronous thoughts or just like sudden urges and feelings to do the exact same thing at the exact same time. It's like very inexplicable, but it aligns with the other person that's connected to them very perfectly, which is an example that we see a lot in identical twins. It is very much like the universal consciousness too, if you Mm -hmm. believe in that 
in that yeah, theory. It's like totally. we are all connected. Therefore, yes, that is why we have empathy and those feelings mm-hmm. is because we truly are made of one another. We're all just stardust. We are stardust. You know what you basically just proved is that we just did an entire episode about physics and we're scientists. <laughs> Theoretical physics. Theoretical. We talked about everything but nothing at the same time. It's theoretical. It's theoretical. We're great at theoretical physics. <laughs> We're great at talking, taking up <laughs> space, taking up airtime. This also relates to the law of attraction, which makes me think of, remember Oprah say your book, The Secret, and everyone was like so obsessed with The Secret, and it was all about like manifesting and law of attraction and all of that. Yeah. So basically, it's kind of the same thing where there's a lot of crossover within the visible string theory and the law of attraction, this like vibrational attraction where your thoughts, your emotions, your energetic state will match with someone who's like-minded romantically or as a friend, a mentor, acquaintance, a pet in the time in your life when they're most meant to be there and help you through a very specific period of growth. Basically, it's manifesting. Sure. And then pertaining to mental health and well-being, the idea of the invisible string theory has proved to be beneficial in emotional healing and self-work. It's something that is brought up in the field of psychology because it can be really helpful to people. It can help us look at our relationships and our Mm -hmm. future with a new lens. It can empower us to navigate challenges with a renewed strength. And it can also help us, this is a note for me, relax a little bit and go with the flow. (laughs) Trust your gut. Trust that the right paths are set out in front of you and you will find them no matter how long it takes you to find them. And these are paths to happiness and support. You will feel that. You can have compassion for others. You can understand a bit more how intricate relationships in the human experience can be when kind of thinking about the invisible string theory. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can spend some time meditating and manifesting. That's something that is encouraged by a lot of therapists out there. You can envision what your life is like, what your partner or your future friends are like, and then try to enjoy the journey as much as you can, even though it will be hard to get there. It's a blessing and the curse of human life. It is. But to wrap up this different topic from what we normally talk about, the invisible string theory, Mm -hmm. the invisible string theory can be quite beautiful and at times very mystical and spooky. But Mm -hmm. just now, we all do have connections out there, whether we believe in the invisible string theory or not, and whether we've met those connections yet or not. And you are important to those people even if you don't know them yet, and they will be important to you. You have a purpose, you belong here, and you get to experience the invisible string theory, whether you've realized it or not, because your connections, they're waiting for you, and you'll feel it. Just so you all know, you're all caught up in our strings. You're tied up, and you can't get out. I'm going to throw you in this cage and stick you (laughs) in there forever. You have no choice. You are stuck in our webs. It, it, I think the paranormal world, we keep talking about it as like a like our community as a triangle, like a pyramid scheme. I do feel like it is kind of a web. We're all just kind of stuck in it. We're just here. We're just here. Yeah. We're all just here. And it's interesting. And we're learning things. I mean, I think our perspectives on things are going to be so different. That like I think we've already changed so much in terms of our perspective on the paranormal. We 100% have. Yeah. And I mean, even think about like, We are a paranormal podcast. We are not a true crime podcast, but I do think sometimes about like how different the way we spoke about true crime is to now. Yeah, 100%. You know, like when podcasting first started, when like all the documentaries with victims and victim blaming and, you know, like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. We evolved. Yeah, we did. It was kind of horrifying to look back, but it was like that was our entertainment. And now I can't even imagine saying some of those things that were said and done. And that's why, that's why I love Sarah Turney so much from Voices yeah. for Justice because she does a lot of work for she's great um, helping people who are yeah. families of victims tell their stories. And even um, Tiffany Reese from Something Was Wrong, again, giving, giving the voice to the people who've experienced it themselves. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a hard thing with true crime sometimes is that the victims can't speak for themselves. Yeah. Not always. So No. I do love that there has been a shift in that narrative. But we're all growing. We're all learning. And let's just take a breath, make our shoulders fall a little bit, 
and just try to enjoy today. <laughs> and just get stuck in the web. Okay. I have a listener story from our listener, Macy, and it is called Haunted by My Soulmate, The Woman of Ooh. My Literal Dreams. I like this already. Ghostesses. This is a little bit of a combo of like soulmate, but also sexy. Okay. <laughs> We're getting sexy for this episode. Well, a lot of this was... It's the invisible string. It was all meant to be. It yeah. all goes back to, <laughs> to ghost smut. <laughs> In fairness, a lot of this episode did talk about romantic partners because that's what people kind of like default to when they're talking about invisible yeah. string theory. Okay. Ghostesses. You asked to hear sexy ghost stories, and I am going to deliver. But first, I need to give a bit of backstory and also disclaimer. This story is 18 and up and begins after I am an adult as well. So I grew up a lesbian in the 90s and 2000s in Texas. It was confusing and a traumatic time, but I finally figured it out and came to terms with it as a senior in high school. There was a girl in my government class that I kind of dated, but I would call it more friends exploring shit than a true relationship, even if it was very gal pals vibes. After she moved away during winter break, I met Lauren, though it was less of a meeting and more of her coming to me. Besides all of the hauntings I experienced growing up, I also have unusual dreaming habits. I'll remember previous dreams in a dream that I have no memory of when awake, and I've been confused when I wake up sleeping on multiple occasions, and my dreams can be so realistic that I can feel small details like bumps on a basketball or individual blades of grass. Wow. So Lauren, before I even met her, showed up first in a dream where I was at an amusement park. I don't remember the exact details of first seeing her, but we spent the rest of the dream together. As the weeks continued, Lauren showed up from time to time in my dreams. And it wasn't long before I really wanted her to show up more and more. I wanted to see her. She told me about herself and her life, and I could give you her whole story. But a few months into these dreams, which was already flirty at the time, she came into my room and we started making out, which led to us taking off our clothes and holy shit, did she know what she was doing? Remember what I said <laughs> nice. about feeling the fine details? Well, I felt everything and I orgasmed so hard that I literally woke up. Oh, in the astral plane? That is... But not in talent. the astral plane. This is... Okay. Because when Macy woke up, I was in the same position I had been in in my dream and my clothes were no longer on my body. <gasps> I freaked what? out. Was she some kind of succubus coming to steal my whole, my soul? What the hell was that? A few days later, I am driving home from school and I hear a voice and it's Lauren's voice. I recognize it from my dreams. Say, I'm sorry, from the passenger seat. I turned and there was no one there, but somehow I knew Lauren was sitting there. I told her I forgive her and we went back to the way things were, except we start spending time outside of the dream world and I feel her, her presence and her soul and her spirit around me. Lauren and I agreed and we disagreed. We had good times and bad ones like any relationship. She had her own opinions on my friends, family, teachers, professors, movies, shows, literally anything and everything. Lauren also appeared to have her own life. She didn't follow me to places like class or work and her presence would be notably absent. But when I would get to my own apartment, she would leave and come back independently according to her schedule, which was somewhat regular like any living person's. What in the world? This is blowing my mind. Back to the fun stuff. Freshman year of college is when we started having sex, when I was conscious as well. I would feel her there, and if you were being a bit of a voyeur, it would look like I'm hovering a little off my bed, pleasuring nothing, or pleasuring myself with the power of my mind. This is a hands-free, like, Macy is not touching themselves. This is, yeah. Lauren even taught me several moves that others have appreciated in my life. Wow. Our relationship I, lasted until I was a junior in college and I met my first girlfriend who I'll call Haley. Haley and I started as friends and I never told her about Lauren and Lauren never mentioned Haley. Not long after Haley and I started dating, Lauren came to tell me goodbye. A few weeks after Haley and I broke up, Lauren returned and our dynamic continued, which has basically been the cycle since Lauren first came to me. I don't know who or what this being is, but even times when I'm intentionally single to work on myself, she's there as a friendly support for anything I could ever need. Whenever I've asked her, she dismisses the question, but she's never said anything creepy like, 
meeting on the other side or she's dead or a demon, etc. There is a TikTok series called Hell's Bells, and one of the relationships is between a succubus angel and a soul that will be reincarnated, Ruggy. So could that be the same situation Lauren and I are in, but she's Hmm. not allowed to tell me about my past? Did I unintentionally make a tulpa? I don't know. What do you think? See you on the other side, Macy. This is so fascinating because I feel like when we've heard, let's default back to that one story that was super popular in the UK and the woman went on the news and like Good Morning America and like different different places like that to talk about how she and her fiance had broken up because she started a relationship with this with the spirit kind of like incubus like spirit where it did seem very sexual and intimate but she was not talking about like the rhythms of daily life and the stuff that Macy and Lauren are experiencing together like actually communicating and discussing and sharing opinions and like an actual relationship that it is feels so like- different Right, especially because Lauren comes and goes. It's not like Lauren's only there for Macy. Lauren Mm -hmm. leaves to attend to whatever they're experiencing, which this makes me think like, is Lauren alive in a different timeline or a different dimension and Lauren is experiencing Macy the way that Macy is experiencing Lauren? I did have that thought too, where Macy's the one that kind of just comes and goes and it's confusing. But then it's also strange because Lauren does feel like She has more of the power in when she appears, right? Where it's like Macy gets in a relationship and Lauren leaves, but then Lauren comes back and it's like, well, how would Lauren have that ability in another lifetime, in another dimension, if Macy is the one haunting Lauren? Lauren is for sure on the board of questions and answers. She, (laughs) Lauren knows what's up. But it does feel like there's very clearly a soulmate connection or like a, universal greater connection between Lauren and Macy Mm -hmm. but I don't know what the answer is but it sounds very pleasurable (laughs) and enjoyable like it seems like a good situation I I feel like I've never heard something like this where it's just like a full-fledged this does feel like that story I wrote my sophomore year of high school about that romance between that lady and her the dead guy (laughs) right I bet Lauren and Macy were soulmates or like have been together in previous lives and will be again. Yeah. Because it does feel like there's so much like tenderness and friendship. Yeah. Too. I agree. Dang. Guardian, but make it sexy. <laughs> it's like me being like godmother, but make it witchy. Yeah. You get a little bit of stir the pot, get two things in one. I feel like this is an incredible experience. I don't know how to describe it or like what it could be. I have no answers, but I'm very happy for Macy that Macy gets yeah. to experience it, especially because it does feel like if there ever came a time when Macy was like, mm, not for me, no longer, I don't like this, then it would stop. Right. Especially because Lauren respects Macy's boundaries. Like when Macy's in a relationship, yeah. Lauren's very much like, I will let you experience this. This is for you. And I will give you the space to have this. Powerful stuff. It would be frustrating, though, for to have that healthy of a relationship in the <laughs> prison not be real or, like, not be alive physically. Right. Yeah, you can't introduce them to your friends. <laughs> yeah, that would be frustrating. I mean, you can introduce – like, they can meet your friends, but your friends can't meet them. Right, right. That would be tough. But at least you get to experience Lauren Macy. Thank you for sharing that with yeah. us. And if any of you have stories about your soulmates or anything paranormal or just want to – enjoy the theoretical physics with us and send us your theory on the invisible string theory please email us to two girls one ghost podcast at gmail.com mm-hmm. you can support us in a variety of ways you can rate and review wherever you listen to the podcast and you can also get people sucked into the triangle that is a pyramid scheme and you tell two people about us you have them start listening and then the community our web of paranormal enthusiasts grow And then we just get more and more ghost stories to be able to share here. And it's pretty awesome. And maybe your future soulmate or someone along your invisible string will be brought into this community and that's how you meet them. Wait, that has happened. I've seen it a couple of times. People have sent us. There's love in the community. We're matchmakers. We won't out anyone for their relationships, but we have seen it be announced between the community. We watch. Yeah. Always watch. Yeah. You can also support us by uh, following us on social media. I guess that's the way to see what we're up to, what we're doing, how mm-hmm. we're hanging. And watch us on YouTube if you want. 
and become a Most Haunted friend on Patreon. It's a pretty sweet place to be. Mm -hmm. You get ad-free one week early episodes. You get bonus episode every single month. We go live on Campfire Stories every Tuesday night where we bring people on stage to tell their ghost stories in front of the audience. There's a lot of other things. Book club, we have Discord. All the things, you guys. We're all connected. All the things. We have put so many strings out to try to lure you. (laughs) Pull you in. Uh, And thank you so much to our editor and producer, Jamie Ryan, for editing our audio and video every week. We're really grateful for you and wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And we will see you on the other other side. side.